evening, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started with our next rendition of Worldwide Wish. Welcome uh, from Wish, Wits University. Uh, just to update you, Wish is now spelt with a small i, and uh, our official name is Wit Sport and Health. So welcome on behalf of uh, Wit Sport and Health Group. And as you know, this is part of our academic offering. And again, we're very privileged to have an international speaker joining us this evening. And if we're a bit sport and health, this is a very fitting talk because it deals with exactly that sport and health. So we're really pleased that we've got another good audience with us this evening. Uh, and we know that many of you represent sports and professional, professional teams and amateur teams, universities and schools from around the world, actually. We've got people from about 20 different countries who join our webinars. So thanks very much for joining us. Thank you to, to the sponsors of the webinar series, the Lito and Asina group, who is a pharmaceutical group. Uh, they make Zepho, the anti-inflammatory medication, uh, which you're all familiar with, and a host of other products that are really useful to the sports medicine fraternity. To, so to uh, Romy Osborne and her team at Lito and Asina, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to broadcast these free of charge and get uh, valuable CPD points for the professionals, uh, not only in the greater Johannesburg area, but uh, around the country and around the world. Welcome to the South African Sports Medicine Association members. And many of you will remember our guest speaker this evening, uh, Craig Young, who spoke at one of our conferences and, and was hugely popular um, as an American College of Sports Medicine representative. So, uh, I'm going to ask you please to be interactive again, to send your questions through on the question and answer facility on Zoom, and we will make sure that we monitor those and we feed them through to Craig at the end uh, to get some interaction and some words of wisdom from him in terms of answering your direct questions, which come as a result of this talk. So it really gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Craig Young. He is Professor in Orthopedic Surgery and Community and Family Medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He is somebody who rolls up his sleeves and he gets really involved on the sideline in sport medicine. He's been the president of the Major League Basketball, Baseball Teams Physician Association. He's been a team physician to the Milwaukee Brewers uh, and the Milwaukee Bucks, and I'm sure he'll explain to us who those are. He's been a physician with the US National and Olympic Ski and Snowboard teams and the US Olympic Committee. Very importantly, uh, Craig has played a significant role in administration in sports medicine in the United States. He is a, a past president of the American Society for Sports Medicine. And when things open up, those of you who are able to, I would really encourage you to attend one AMSSM conference. It is probably the best sports medicine conference that I've ever attended, and I've attended a few of those now, uh, really top quality. And Craig has been one of those individuals who set the bar in terms of the educational offering there. So we're very, very privileged to have him with us. And it's not only traditional sport that he gets involved in. He's been the company physician for the Milwaukee Ballet and the Skylight Opera as well. So he's really very experienced and as an editorial as an editor, he's been on the editorial board of the Clinical Journal of Sports Medicine. And as I read the last line of his biography here, he's a co-editor of Netta's Sports Medicine textbook, which reminds me that I owe him a chapter. Um, and I will promise to get that to him uh, hopefully in the next month. So Craig, I'm going to uh, hand over to you, uh, having introduced you, uh, for this very, very important topic of looking at how we return to sport in the context of this sort of infectious disease, not only of COVID-19, but what the implications are for us looking forward. And perhaps before we go into your formal talk, just set the scene for us, talk to us a little bit about what's happening in the USA in terms of your sporting leagues, professional sporting leagues, what's happening at the universities, what's happening at school and club level. Because we're, we're in a situation here where we have some of our professional teams starting to go back uh, and frustratingly, a lot of the amateur teams not participating. So where is America at the moment? Well, 
thank you for your kind introduction. Uh, hopefully my words will be as wise as you made them out to be. Uh, America at this point, I think is just a, maybe a little ahead of where you are as far as return to sports. It's very controversial here. Um, we're, as I, we talked a little bit, things are very political here. So there's health issues and there's political issues going on at the same time. Um, probably our first sports to go back, as you might imagine, was the Professional Golfers Association, because that seems like a sport that you can do without, as long as you don't have an audience there, obviously is fairly safe. Um, they just ran the Indianapolis 500, which traditionally is run uh, over Memorial Day weekend, which is uh, right around ACSM. So end of May, beginning of June, they delayed it until last weekend when they ran it with no audience. And uh, baseball, they delayed the opening. And uh, I was the covering doc for opening day. And there's usually over 45,000 people in our stadium. And there were maybe five of us in the seats. So it was a very weird, actually, I, I described it like being in a dystopian science fiction movie because they were piping in crowd noises, fake crowd noises from behind me. And you're looking around and there's no crowd in the audience. So very strange times. Um, college football, which is a big thing here in America. Uh, that's not soccer football, but American football. Uh, two of our major leagues, the Big 10 and the uh, Pac-12 both canceled their seasons, whereas the other major leagues so far, many of them are going on. So things certainly will be evolving and we'll, I'll talk, touch on these things in my talk as well. Great, we look forward to it. I'm gonna switch off my camera and hand everything over to you as you share your screen. Thanks very much. All right, well, thank you very much, John, for that introduction. Um, as John said, I'm gonna be talking about infection disease prevention planning for sports in the time of COVID-19. So here's my disclosures. First of all, you need to know I'm not an infectious disease expert. And I have to thank my infectious disease consultant, Michael Frank, for uh, a lot of the things that he helped me with with planning these things. But because of COVID and because of the teams I work with, I've been forced into helping design COVID-19 plans for multiple teams and organizations, specifically the Brewers, the Milwaukee Bucks, which is our NBA team, and the Milwaukee Ballet. Those are the main three organizations I've been working with for their COVID-19 plans. I do work with uh, a number of other sports teams as John alluded to. So this was a brand new lecture. I created it in late July through early August was when I did the bulk of this lecture. So some of this may be already out of date, and in fact, I just added a slide this morning to help uh, correct things. Uh, and I can almost guarantee that some of this will be incorrect in the near future because there's no question that our knowledge on COVID-19 continues to evolve um, almost on a daily basis. Uh, it's also important to remember that in this lecture, I'm primarily focusing on COVID-19 and athletes and not in the general public. So I'm not gonna talk about all issues uh, that may be related to COVID-19, really focusing those primarily related to sports and the athletes. And I'm gonna focus on prevention and diagnosis and not the treatment. Um, my goals are to talk about COVID-19. I'm gonna place it in historical context to start with. I'll go over some of the scientific background of what we know with COVID-19. And this is important because it helps us with our planning processes. Uh, then we're gonna spend, a most of the time on practical applications. And I'm gonna try and avoid political stuff, I hope. Uh, John assured me in South Africa that COVID-19 isn't as political in the United States. As much as I'm trying to avoid being political, I'm sure if I gave this lecture or those people who, who are signed on in the US, there would be certainly individuals who would find some of this stuff potentially political, even though I'm purposely trying not to, trying to avoid that. Um, particularly when it comes to mask wearing and stuff like that, a very somewhat political issue in the United States. So this kind of started back in March when, like many of you, I had heard something about some kind of new respiratory disease that was going on in, the, in, in China and the Far East. But, you know, as Americans tend to be, kind of, it wasn't involved, affecting me, and I'm not a um, public health official, 
So I was kind of blissfully ignorant down in Arizona with my wife uh, during spring training for the Brewers, avoiding the Wisconsin winters where it's freezing. And then on March 12th, all of a sudden, they suspend spring training because of uh, the COVID outbreak. And shortly thereafter, uh, the NBA decided to shut down as well because uh, as fairly well known, one of the uh, players who licked several microphones in a press conference and said that COVID was not really an issue, uh, tested positive for COVID. So since that time, if you look at Google News, you can see right under headlines, the first thing is COVID-19 news. So you can go right to that without going, without and ignore the rest of the world and national headlines. So it's certainly been a major problem. And then here's, here's a kind of a brief screenshot of my cell phone. Scott Faust is the Brewers, or sorry, the Milwaukee Bucks trainer. And those people who know me know I'm not a big cell phone fan, but this is what was this like, in a 24 hour period, you can see he called me, I don't know, 20 times or something like that. And Cindy there is our nurse practitioner who is in charge of testing the box. So she called me once and it, my phone was going crazy. Here's, the, here's the, uh, something that you don't want to be on. It's not like winning gold medals in the Olympics and, and being the first place nation. Well, up there at number one is the United States of America. 4.75 million cases out of the 18 million plus uh, cases in the world. And this was from early in early August. And so the United States had 26% uh, of the world's infections. And then uh, unfortunately for you guys in South Africa, you come in fifth and you have 2.8% of the um, COVID cases. Uh, we had, we had 22% uh, of the world's deaths due to COVID and you guys are at 1.2. Uh, percent of the total so all right so we've been hearing a lot about COVID what is it well COVID is a virus that there are hundreds of different strains of viruses and they infect both birds and mammals in in animals they traditionally invade many different tissues and cause a variety of diseases interestingly human coronaviruses are not transmitted by animals and in humans traditionally we were taught that Coronaviruses cause mild to moderate upper respiratory infections, basically common colds, bronchiolitis. And on rare occasions, it's been found in the GI system and has been associated with outbreaks of diarrhea in, in children, but still fairly mild disease. So that was what coronaviruses were. And there are four different main types of coronaviruses that had been around for years. Then we started seeing some different coronaviruses occur. And you might remember SARS, I'll talk about that a little bit, MERS, and now re more recently, this cars covid 2 That's the one that causes COVID-19. So the first one of these was SARS. That appeared in 2003 to 2004. Um, it, this little creature here, over here, the, the civet is what, they think the original animal source of the virus was. Uh, for those of you who are coffee lovers, uh, you may realize that this is the uh, little animal that eats uh, the coffee berries, I think it is, and, and the stomach enzymes digest it and supposedly give it this unique flavoring, and then it poops out the, uh, the coffee bean, which is collected by people. And uh, I calculated this out, and they charge in US dollars, $34.28 per ounce on Amazon to get uh, this special civet coffee versus Starbucks, which is moderately expensive in the States. It's not your cheapest coffee. That's 87 cents an ounce. So pretty expensive stuff. Uh, anyway, SARS affected 26 countries, over 8,000 cases, and it had about a 10% mortality rate, but it burned out and no cases have been seen since 2004. MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, is from camels. It affected 27 countries, about 2,500 cases, and the mortality rate was actually pretty amazing. It was 35%, so if you got MERS, that was a big deal. Uh, most cases were found in a two-year period between 2014 and 2015, and there have been sporadic outbreaks since, but 
really not much, and it's all been localized to the Middle East for the most part. So although those briefly made the news, uh, obviously here in America, since they didn't really affect us too much, we didn't hear a lot about them. So around comes SARS or COVID-19. Uh, first case was reported at the very end of the year in Wuhan. Then as you can see, it's kind of spread from country to country. Uh, Wuhan went into a complete lockdown. They had started having cases in Europe in March, just before uh, I found out about that, that was when who, the World Health Organization declared this a pandemic. And by uh, the end of March, we had cases in 150 countries. And at first, like everybody else, I'm like, okay, well, this, this seems to be an adult illness, doesn't affect kids. Uh, but as Robin would say, uh, you know, that here, starting in late April, we start seeing it in, in children as well. All right, looking at this graph, here's the trends. Uh, overall, the, these are divided up. This is from the World Health Organization, and it's through the end of July. And you can see it's divided up by areas, but you don't have to pay attention to that. I think the important thing is to just see the spectacular growth of COVID through the world. It's, it's really um, spreading rapidly. Uh, is there a silver lining right now? Well, this is in the United States. You can see our curves here where it kind of spiked. We shut down things in a lot, many states, but not all states. And then things reopened and we're getting a second spike up here. I don't know if this is good news or that we're getting better in treating this because initially uh, you can see here's our death curves. And even though we're getting a lot more cases, we're seeing that people aren't dying as, as frequently. So this may be because partially we're getting better at treating this, or it may be just epidemiologically that a lot more young people are being infected and those in individuals tend to get more mild cases and or fight off the infection better. Here you are in South Africa. Again, uh, you guys are lagging behind us, but you got that uh, nice peak, it, but it's coming down. So hopefully that's a silver lining for you guys um, and the death rates leveling out as well. Just to put this in historical context, uh, this was from the Nas a recent National Geographic article that just came out. Uh, if you look back at some of the, the previous major pandemics, uh, you can see the bubonic plague there at the top, it, it killed off between a quarter to 60% of the population. Uh, the smallpox and other European germs, which the Native Americans had not been exposed to, is thought to have wiped out 90 to 95% of the Native Americans. Uh, the influenza of 1918, which is sometimes known as the Spanish flu, although that's kind of incorrect because it didn't really start in Spain, but because Spain was neutral in World War, II, World War I, uh, they had less restrictions on the journalism, so it became known as the place that it was, it was people knew about it, and so it was called the Spanish flu. In any case, it affected a third of the world's population. Um, and then you can see, you guys are probably more familiar with Ebola, although when I visited South Africa, I realized that Africa is a huge country and uh, you, South Africa is probably about as far from Ebola as the United States. Uh, but that's got affected a lot of uh, people in Africa and has a huge death rate. HIV, a huge number of people worldwide with an overall death rate of 40%. Now, we, that involved, includes the people who died at the beginning of AIDS where we were very bad at treating it. So that rate is dropping uh, as time goes on. And then we can see SARS and MERS. The next graphic is actually the, the picture from the National Geographic again. And, and I think it's interesting because it, it tells us that, that what we, emotionally we're affected by the things that we're living in, which makes sense. I mean, you can see plague here on the far left-hand side of that graph huge amount of death over a huge amount of time. And in fact, plague pop, re pops up. Uh, the influenza of 1918 to 1919, look at that spike. That is just a huge amount of deaths. And then I put on to the graph, I, I, right here on the corner is where COVID-19 is. So you, you can see really COVID-19, at least death rate doesn't even come close to these other uh, pandemics that have occurred through history. Now, of course, we are living 
COVID-19 and COVID-19 is still marching on. So I, I suppose if this graph gets, becomes a nightmare, then maybe our spike will match some of these things. We certainly hope not. And hopefully some of the things that we talk about today will prevent it from becoming one of these big spikes. All right, so finally, let me just conclude the historical part by saying that right now, there have actually only been two diseases that have been known to be completely eliminated in the world, uh, or at least according to the World Health Organization. That's smallpox, which was eliminate, eliminated in uh, May of 1980, and then something called rinderpest, which is known as the plague of cattle, uh, which was eliminated in 2011. And we have one disease which has almost been eradicated, which is polio. Uh, there were 94 cases last year. They're only, the only cases in the wild are found in two countries, um, Afghanistan and uh, um, Pakistan. Uh, and it actually dropped to a low of 33 cases one year, but they haven't quite been able to eradicate that one. That one's close. All right, so how about COVID-19? Uh, although I see that at least it seems when you look compared to historical data, it, it hasn't been that bad, but part of the problem is we're living it. And also as uh, we know that the internet spreads a lot of information. It can be good. Hopefully what you're hearing right now is good and I'm giving you reasonably uh, good scientifically based information, but unfortunately, the internet spreads a lot of rumors as well. Uh, the, actually, the World Health Organization has a page on their website called Mythbusters uh, because so many people are saying so much information on cures and, and, and things to try and prevent it that the World Health Organization has actually come up with this list of things that you can go to and they try and disprove all these rumors. Uh, on the right side, you can also see that a lot of people are trying to make a lot of money off of stuff from COVID-19, uh, be it just um, hoarding or overcharging for uh, healthcare supplies or having tests and cures and preventions that really don't work. Part of the problem is we have to look at what's theoretical and what happens in real life. And uh, you may be familiar with some of this stuff, but there were some studies that came out to show how long uh, COVID would last on inanimate objects. And so a lot of people got really scared because you can see some of this stuff here, you know, plastic in, in theory, you can find it, it can live on a piece of plastic for up to 72 hours and be infectious. Stainless steel, two days. And so a lot of people started uh, quarantining their mail, not picking up uh, uh, packages. Uh, I know. I know some people were like washing uh, all their food. Um, so some pretty crazy stuff uh, because of these studies. Well, the problem with a lot of these studies is is they don't. They haven't been proven to actually. Even though something can theoretically live on uh, on a piece of plastic for three days, it doesn't seem like people are really picking up COVID from plastic. Um, and we know that, that, that many diseases do spread versus via fomites and inanimate objects, but certainly has not been shown in the United States that there's been no clusters of individuals who, for example, the delivery guy who's, since a lot of us are shopping by, by uh, the internet and Amazon and stuff like that, there's been no delivery driver who's had been, found to have sick, been sick with COVID who spread it to all the people he's delivered to. So I think it's relatively low risk of, of getting COVID from, from a fomite. Now that's not to say it's impossible because certainly if you're uh, a healthcare worker who's in a COVID ward where you have individuals who are very sick with COVID who are coughing, et cetera, the, they, there's been studies that show surfaces in those situations have a, a, certainly a much higher concentration of the virus on it. And it's more, the higher your concentration of virus, the more likely you are to actually uh, be infected. So a lot of, again, a lot of the problems are we have a lot of theoretical stuff, 
with cough chambers um, and things that show what kind of droplet pattern people will, will have and what kind of masks uh, prevent certain things, but there's not been any really great studies for some of these things. Now, here in the United States, uh, we, 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 we use a six foot rule. Um, sorry, I forgot to convert that into meters. But uh, this was actually originally came from, uh, was developed as the three foot rule, which was a Harvard researcher who was studying tuberculosis. And he, he looked and found that droplets that were emitted during breathing, coughing, and sneezing tended to land less than three feet away from the, the individual. There was a, a study done in 1982, where, which had a meningococcal um, spread in, in one of the elementary schools. And they found that students who had their desk less than 3.3 feet apart were at much higher risk to catch it. So that's where they kind of came up with the six foot rule, figuring that if it's a respiratory disease, if, if as long as you were over six feet apart, you were less likely to catch this. And you can see that uh, this study that they basically looked at it to see how, depending on the size of the droplet on that graphic, will determine how far somebody can, uh, the, the droplet will last before it dissipates. So uh, this is a picture of uh, our 4th of July. Our, no, actually, sorry. This is a picture of my wife's book club. At least that's what she claims it's from. Uh, I'm not sure. I really believe it because none of the women in this are holding wine glasses. So that makes me think that this actually isn't their book club. Anyway, uh, again, so there's a lot of different studies that have been done here on a basic science level on how far this respiratory pathogen can potentially get. There's still some argument whether or not this is uh, droplet spread or aerosol spread. Uh, aerosol spread certainly would increase the risk of transmission uh, and lingering. Um, my infectious disease colleagues tell me that they believe that this is primarily aeros or sorry, primarily droplet spread, which is good because that means that m most masks are more effective and that in theory, that physical distancing of that six foot rule uh, will decrease, tremendously decrease the amount of spread. The infection of COVID-19, we're not 100% sure of all the ways it's infectious, but we do know that it is related to um, the concentration of, of um, the ACE receptors. So these are highest in the nose. So that's thought to be the easiest area to infect, uh, followed by the mouth and the eyes. So because of all these things, the fact that it, we think it's droplet spread primarily, uh, we think it's related, the infectivity is related to concentration of uh, the ACE receptors. This is where a mask came into play. So there's been a lot, number of studies. You can see this study here was looking at high-speed video to see how, how droplets are spread. And this showed that most of the droplets were actually spread by just covering the mouth with a, a wet, damp washcloths. Other, other studies have come out since that one, which have looked at various types of material. And you can see surgical mask is up at the top there. Um, and various uh, other masks. And they, they actually do a pretty good job against uh, blocking uh, particles, uh, even down to scarves and cotton t-shirts. And so the more layers you have, the more, the, the tighter the weave is, the better it is overall. Finally, we're getting some tests that actually show some uh, using that uh, virus to see how well they, these things block. And this was a, a, a study from Nature where they look at, and you can see on the top, here's the coronavirus. And you can see that when, you, when you're wearing a, a mask, it really drops down the viral particles that are, are, are generated to really minimal. Here's the droplets, and this is with and without a mask compared to the influenza virus, which isn't blocked quite as much. And then the rhinovirus really is, 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 although it decreases, it doesn't decrease tremendously. So the good news is, at least as far as COVID-19 goes, these limited studies show that it's probably fairly effective. Well, that's all great when you look at on a theoretical basis, 
how about some clinical evidence? And I think this is where it, it's kind of useful to look at the epidemiology uh, of some of these studies. Now, admittedly, some of these are, are case studies, but I think they're useful as illustrations. So in, in Springfield, Missouri, there was uh, two stylists who um, had close contact with 140 of their clients who were, were sick while they had COVID-19. The good news is all the clients and both the stylists actually wore masks during their entire uh, hairstyling. And none of the clients actually tested positive despite having this close contact. Another case showed two passengers on a flight from China to Toronto. Um, so fairly long flight and uh, they had dry coughs while they were in, in flight and they, the day after they landed, they both tested positive for COVID. And we know that the infectivity period for COVID uh, is, is especially high for up to three days before you start developing symptoms on to the next four days. So both, they were in their highest infected period, they both wore masks, and none of the other 350 passengers or crew members were infected, including the, the 25 close contacts. So those would be the people in the two rows in front of them and the two rows behind them. Um, so that, that's pretty good evidence that wearing a mask uh, will help prevent potential transmission. Uh, then there's some epidemiological studies which were pretty interesting. And uh, one of the studies showed that the growth rate before and after mass mandates, and basically five days after the mandate, the daily growth rates uh, slowed by almost a percent. Three weeks after uh, the mandate, the daily growth rate had slowed by 2%. So it shows that these mass mandates probably are slowing the, the, the spread. Uh, another study looked at COVID deaths in 198 countries. And what they found was that countries that had either cultural norms or government policies favoring mask wearing had a lower death rate than countries that just kind of did whatever they wanted to. Um, here's a study that, did, uh, that was done in New York City. And you can see, so here's the initial outbreak in New York City. Uh, they, put social distancing, so the six-foot rule, into effect uh, between March 15th to about March uh, about 22nd, I guess that is. Then they put in the stay-at-home rule where they basically shut down the city, and you can see that it continues to peak up. And then they put in the face covering rule and, and things start coming down. Now, this doesn't necessarily say that face covering is, is what stopped things, because remember, there is a bit of a lag time here, but it certainly seems to be helpful in controlling the outbreak. Um, this, this graph over here extrapolates again. So this dotted line is what would happen if they didn't have, if, if things continued as if, as, as it was. And then this line is where they implemented the mask rule. And so you can see after that mask rule gets implemented in Italy, the rate of expected or the rate of COVID infections drops off of what the expected rate would have been had they not implemented the rule. This is the same thing for New York City. This line is when they implemented the mask rule. This is what actually happened. And this is the dotted line is what would happen if the uh, growth rate con continued uh, as expected. If you're really interested in um, a pretty comprehensive review of the literature on masks, uh, this was uh, an article that was published by Howard uh, that just kind of reviewed all the uh, studies uh, up to date, and that was uh, as of as of April. All right, so if I maybe convince you that masks might be a good idea, and for your athletes and your staff you have some things to think about. And I think these are, these are kind of important practical consideration. First of all, you want to know who's going to wear them, when they're going to wear them, uh, because part of the problem with our athletes is it depends on, on, this, on the sport you're in, uh, but a lot of athletes find that, that breathing with the uh, mask on can be interfering, the mask itself can get in the way of them or just be distracting. Um, you also want to think about do you want to wear a mask or do you want to have a Nick Gator? And you can see that, so the Nick Gator in this picture of the baseball player is just this kind of 
like scarf thing that's they wear around their neck and then they can yank it up when they get near somebody. Comfort's a really key pro thing as well because if, it, if it's uncomfortable, people just aren't gonna wear them. Um, and for the most part, I would recommend against wearing N95 masks, FFP2 masks or P2 masks. Uh, these are masks that are very good at filtering out particles, as you could see from those earlier mask um, studies. The problem is they're really hard to breathe in, and most people find them incredibly uncomfortable, uh, even when they're doing lightweight work. These were originally designed for uh, construction workers and, and individuals like that who had were doing a construction where they'd have all sorts of small particles of wood or dry drywall and stuff like that. And so they weren't even some well some they were working hard, but they weren't running around and necessarily exercising. So they're not really designed for that. And you can see. The picture on the right is a collection of the masks that I have been issued by either my hospital or uh, one of the teams are accumulated uh, along the way. So it's important to think about who's going to wear these, when they need to wear them, and again, making them comfortable and, and people willing to wear them. Um, it's also really important to think about logo and design policy. I think you can get yourself into some big trouble. Uh, here in the United States, masks as it is are political and uh, as you can see on the top line is some, some workers sued their employer because they weren't allowed to wear a uh, mask that supported a particular political cause. Whether or not you think a political cause is right or wrong, the problem is somebody is gonna come up with something that somebody else doesn't like. So I think it's better if you come up with the policy in advance that either there is no political statement or design, or maybe it's just all related to your team or corporate logo, which seems to take the problem out of the way. Um, again, make sure you have something that's practical. For example, when I run, I find it more easy to wear a Nick gaiter and just being able to yank that up when I get close to somebody rather than try and strap on the mask uh, that's, that I'm holding in my hand. Totly, tightly woven cotton material seems to work better than synthetic material. The more layers you have, uh, the more it's protective, but the harder it is to breathe. And then some of the things actually have a little slot where you can put a filter in uh, that uh, can increase the filtering ability and the decreased spread. In fact, I have one right here. This is one that came with one of my masks that I can just slip between the two layers if I want additional um, protection or protection for other people. One of the bigger problems is mask comfort. And I know all of us at work, we've been wearing these things and, and you start getting soreness around the ears, especially if those of us who aren't surgeons. Um, I realize this, this is one reason why I, I probably avoid it going into surgery uh, is because of mass discomfort. Anyway, you can buy these things uh, commercially. They're pretty cheap actually, uh, but here's, here's two different ones. And here's some that actually we invented in our clinic. Uh, this is one of our medical assistants and she took some Coban and you, she just strapped the coban around and stapled it around the the mask there and it increased the distance so she doesn't have to wear it around her ear this is one that i actually created uh, if you have some theraband tubing you just take the theraband tubing slit it and put it around the uh, mask strap and it helps decrease the amount of pressure being put on the ears so that's what i'm using now uh, it's also key to instruct your athletes and personnel to wear their mask properly because wearing a mask wrong is like wearing a, a diaper in the wrong place. Neither does much good. That was a quote from John Oliver. I thought that was good. Uh, so it's important to make sure the mask covers both the mouth and the nose. And actually that's another problem with those mask studies is a lot of times they don't check and see what, even though they're theoretical, they don't check and see how well sealed the mask is and how much stuff is spraying above or below the mask and then through the gaps. Here's the bottom line on masks. Masks significantly decrease the risk of somebody with disease spreading COVID to others. There's no question about that. If you have COVID and you're wearing a mask, it's helping to discrete, decrease the amount of dispersal that you can do because a good mask is gonna collect most of the droplets in the material and prevent them from spreading. Masks to a lesser extent will protect the person from, who's wearing the mask from catching disease from somebody who has it. If both people 
the person with the disease and the person who uh, doesn't have the disease wear masks, it exponentially decreases the overall spread of the disease. So it's really important uh, to make sure that anybody with the disease is wearing it. But overall, if you can get everybody to wear it, it's really gonna help decrease the spread of the disease. Uh, the N95, F, FP2, and P2 masks, you wanna reserve those for high risk situations. I'm not sure what everybody who's on this call has as far as um, pro personal protective equipment supply is. I know in the United States still these uh, high quality filters, the ones that filter out the most, are still in shortage. So you wanna res reserve those and for situations where basically there's gonna be a lot of aerosolization because the other masks do pretty well against droplets. The problem with the cloth masks, the surgical masks, uh, and the homemade masks is they don't really help with aerosolized particles. So if, if somebody's getting extubated or something like that, there are certain procedures that are gonna cause aerosolization of particles, those you wanna be wearing your N95 mask for sure. If you're in a COVID ward where there's a high uh, concentration of the, the COVID, that would be another reason to wear one of these uh, high quality super filtering masks. Uh, and in general, you wanna avoid these masks with ex exhalation valves because if you have an exhalation valve on it, it's not gonna prevent the spread of disease to other. So the only reason to be wearing one of those is if you were an uninfected healthcare worker or something like that, who was an employee in a COVID ward. So you're basically trying to get protected from catching it since everybody around you has it. But if you have it and you are wearing a mask with an exhalation valve, the exhalation valve is going to allow the COVID virus to get blown out into the environment. And it's not going to do a great job protecting. Uh, so you want to encourage people to wear masks when unable to distance and not in their personal space. Uh, what about other personal protective equipment? Uh, this is Cindy. She's getting ready to uh, do uh, our swab testing on the box. You can see that this is uh, extra long tables and stuff like that because of the NBA players. Um, she's wearing the face shield because she's gonna be doing uh, nasal pharyngeal and oral pharyngeal swabs and some of the uh, individuals are prone to coughing. Um, so that would be a time when you wanna wear additional face protection. Uh, extubation, like I said, and if you're around COVID positive, known COVID positive patients. How about gloves? Well, you definitely wanna wear gloves in with COVID uh, patient care, and again, with procedures at risk for aerosolization. Cindy's not wearing them yet. She's gonna put them on uh, before she, and change them between each individual uh, that she's doing the testing for. How about equipment and facilities cleaning? Well, I think, again, we, we don't think that COVID-19 is transmitted very much by equipment equipment and other inanimate objects. I mean, theoretically, if somebody with COVID coughs on the, their hand and then opens the doorknob and you come up right behind them and grab the doorknob and then rub it on your face, yeah, you're gonna catch it. But for the most part, it doesn't seem to be transmitted by these inanimate objects. I mean, it's reasonable to do, I think it's reasonable to do reasonable stuff. So, you know, take your disinfectant and clean your surfaces better than you than you normally would maybe, or actually what we should all be doing. And I was talking with John earlier about this, but since we've been doing all this COVID precautions and like, I don't know if anybody ever cleaned the keyboards in our office before COVID, now they get cleaned daily. And same thing with the desks and stuff like that. So there's been a tremendous drop in just regular old upper respiratory infections uh, because everybody's be doing what we're supposed to do. And, you know, we're washing our hands, we're not rubbing our eyes and things along those natures. So I think doing reasonable stuff is, is, is a good idea. You can see in the middle picture, that's the Bucks practice facility. And you can see there's the basketballs in the one with the red X over it on the far left. Those are basketballs that the players have used. And so they're being put over there. Since one player used them, they are now gonna be put aside until somebody can clean them. Uh, the ones in, with the green check marks means those are clean basketballs. I mean, is that overkill? Maybe, uh, but again, it doesn't take a lot of cost and the effort is kind of average. 
On the other hand, on the right hand side, you can see one of our professional football teams installed this COVID misting booth to disinfect players. Now, I thought this was probably a ridiculous waste of money since COVID is primarily a respiratory infection. So unless this mist, they're breathing in and out, which I highly doubt, uh, you know, just wa having them walk through and wash off their uniforms and, and, and whatever skins is exposed seemed like a kind of excessive use of money, but you know, some teams have it, I guess, is that makes their players feel more comfortable. I mean, it's not gonna hurt, probably, but it seems like from a resource point of view, that doesn't seem like a very effective way of, of, of treating things. So I wouldn't recommend doing something like that unless you just had tons of money to burn. What's important, again, is this proper hygiene, you know, washing hands and, and telling the players this stuff because uh, let's face it, uh, those of us who are athletes, uh, when we're in the locker room, we're maybe not as clean as we should be. It's not like we're, we're in a surgical situation. Uh, making sure we cover our mouths and, and when we cough or sneeze. And this was the hard one for me is not to touch my eyes, nose and mouth because I have allergies and so I get a runny nose and it's very easy to, to, to do these things. It's kind of a natural reaction. Um, so really educating the players to avoid doing this stuff is, is really important. And then cleaning off any kind of uh, contaminated surface, obviously. Uh, common sense self-isolation actually works quite well if you can get people to do this. You know, stay home when you're sick, except for to get medical care. I mean, I know as a, as a resident and as a, even an attending physician, there have been times when I was pretty sick in the past when I'm like, okay, well, I've got to see patients. So I'd go in and, and you know, take precautions and wear a mask and stuff. But now I think we're learning that you should just cancel clinic and, and not see patients because it's going to minimize the risk of spread of things. Uh, so we want to be, have situational awareness. Again, in a COVID ward, you're, you're going to have a much higher likelihood of tra atypical transmission. So Fomite transmission definitely probably can occur in a COVID ward. Airborne transmission, much more likely. When you're around symptomatic COVID patients, people who are coughing, people who are more ill, those are all reasons why you're gonna get a higher concentration of COVID around. So you're gonna to have to take additional precautions. But if you're just wandering around randomly around your grocery store or something, actually the chance of you getting COVID is probably pretty small. We do know that there have been at least reports, we had a case uh, in Washington State where there was a choir that was singing and a high percentage of individuals got sick in that choir. Uh, and initially we were wondering, is this the same as shouting? And the answer is yes, uh, potentially. There was a study that recently came out that showed that singing itself does not aerosolize more COVID. It's actually, a p or I should say, does not produce more droplets and aerosolized particles because these weren't done on individuals who had COVID. Uh, but this, this study did show that the louder you sang, the more droplets you produced. And the same thing happened if you, you spoke. If you spoke at a whisper, you would produce less droplets than if you, you spoke at normal tone. And then if you shout it, you'd produce even more. And shouting actually produced the same as singing. And let, for those of us uh, who are on the sidelines, we know at least occasionally a coach uh, shouts out the players. So there definitely can be a risk here. Uh, is it possible to stop COVID? Well, it looked like New Zealand was doing a pretty good job. It's been held up as a, a, an area that has really done well. So they, had, they went 100 days after they clamped down uh, with, with no COVID cases. Unfortunately, at day 102, all of a sudden, uh, some COVID popped up. So, but I think it does show that in theory, if we, as a community, make a consorted effort, that it is possible to at least make COVID uh, a, a minimal problem. All right, now we're on to discussing protocols here. All right, this is the protocols that the NBA came up with over here. Here's the uh, MLB protocol, and uh, on the final far, far right is the protocol that, the, that our team came up with for the Brewers. Um, the first thing that you wanna think about is 
what is the disease, you know, and this has changed a lot. This is what I had initially in my initial protocol back in when we shut down spring training and here's what we got currently. And the problem is if you look at some of the symptoms and we know that, I mean, every day it seems like they're, they're adding another symptom that is related to COVID. And the problem is if you look at a lot of this stuff, you know, headache, well, how often do people have headaches? Often. Often do people have, uh, you know, runny nose? Well, if you have allergies, it's all the time. So it, it was hard to kind of sort out what do this is the symptoms you're going to be worried the person had COVID. And, and so, you know, shortness of breath, we knew that from the Wuhan studies that that was a, a big problem, uh, but that was rare. So, but things, think about loss of smell, loss of taste. You know, most things don't cause those things. So when somebody has that, I, I really start worrying. Uh, but some of this other stuff, it just comes out with colds. And, you know, we always did, uh, when we were in professor rounds, we always would, at the, stu professor, the students would go, well, the professor would tell us, well, what's also in the differential? And you keep going down from the obvious stuff to the more obscure stuff. Well, one of the things that you can now answer is COVID-19, because basically that can present as anything. Where is COVID found? Well, we definitely know it's in respiratory secretions. It's been found in stool, actually in higher concentrations than respiratory secretions, but really hasn't been found to be transmitted that way. It's been found in semen, rare, in rare cases, and we think it's probably in vomitus, although that hasn't been proven. Um, it's not been found in sweat, which is good for us who are covering athletes. Tears, it has been found with RNA, but not live virus. Breast milk, again, RNA, but not live virus and not found in blood or vaginal fluid as of this time. Things we don't know about COVID, a lot. The percentage of people who are infected and asymptomatic, we don't know how long the antibodies last, although there's a guess now. People are saying about 12 weeks is probably how long they last. Do they give immunity, and if so, how long? Again, an unknown question, I'll come back to that one. And what are the most effective treatment protocols, and what are the long-term effects? Uh, I'm not going to really sp spend any time on the, uh, the NIH guidelines. I just have this in here uh, for your reference, but I think this is going to change the most of anything in this presentation. You also have to look at your sport and analyze your sport. When I was originally thinking about, about our baseball team, uh, I was thinking, wow, there's going to be a lot of close contacts, all these guys standing next to each other. And of course, there's the fans in the stadium. And in the NBA, obviously, there were going to be a lot of people. Um, in close contact. And the other, you, we also have to look at our schedule. Here's, here's the Brewers schedule, and we basically have games every day with few off days. Whereas the Bucks schedule, a lot of off days, and, and we're home a lot. We also think, have to think about how we're gonna do things. Uh, in the baseball, we have to travel. Uh, the, in baseball, it's estimated that if, if we were trying to get in a bubble, we'd have to cram the equivalent of 120 teams into a small spot. Whereas the NBA, they did go into the bubble and they took 22 teams originally. And then over here is the golfers, you know, where again, although they have to travel from city to city, at least we know they're not bumping into each other. So there is a nice article, by the way, in the, uh, the South African Journal of Sports Medicine on uh, COVID resumption uh, in the era of COVID. And, I, and I, I read it and it's a really nice article. Uh, there are a couple things that have changed, but I wish this was around when I was planning things. Um, I've been told, asked to say, what is the bubble? The bubble is basically for the NBA, everybody is concentrated in certain hotels in a complex in Orlando, which has multiple stadiums. And so everybody plays in there. They can't leave this, the area. They're, they can't go off the boundaries of the area. If they do, they get penalized and uh, have to go through a quarantine period. Um, getting into some testing here, uh, one of the things you also have to look at is how accurate the tests are. So if we had a 99.9% specificity and 99% sensitivity, the good news is the negative predictive value of this is great. And the, false, the positive predictive value is also pretty good. Unfortunately, the tests aren't that good. Here we, here we can see what's closer to what we're thinking. If you have 95% sensitivity and 90% 5% specificity with 0.5% uh, of prevalence in the population, 
uh, you can see the false positive rate is going to be 5.2%. Uh, if you only have 80% sensitivity, oops, I must have made some calculation mistakes here because uh, that's the same false positive rate. Anyway, so I apologize for that. I think I put copied and put down the wrong numbers there. MLB expects to have 2,500 false positive rates in our abbreviate season because we're doing so many tests, a small portion of them are going to be positive. And this is one of the really important thing that you guys need to think about when you're planning is what do you do when you have a positive test? Uh, for example, our, our orthopedic surgeon actually was one of our false pauses on our, 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 our team. And so fortunately, we, he was able to get a point of care test followed by a PCR test all within 12 hours because if he didn't, he would have had to cancel a bunch of surgical cases the next day. Plus, you have to think of it from a coverage perspective. If you're positive, what are you gonna do as far as who's gonna cover the team, especially if you're the only trainer or physician who's gonna be at that team. Um, when, to think of, another thing to think about is when you get a bunch of positive tests, if you have a group of positive tests, it's probably real. If you have a single person who's pos positive, it may be real, but it also may be a false positive. And that has, been the case with several of our teams. Um, you can look at test types. They have different uh, sensitivities and specificities. They also have different uh, speeds of doing things. And that's the problem with the point of care test. The point of care tests actually currently take too long to process. Uh, it takes five to 30 minutes for most of the point of care tests to get a per person. And so they're not really useful for screening the whole team. They're useful for um, following up with positive tests. Uh, the PCRs, there's uh, nasal pharyngeal, nasal and oral. Nasal pharyngeal are most accurate, but they're very uncomfortable. And if you're doing them regularly, your players will probably revolt. Uh, we do the saliva in baseball, which initially I thought was pretty cool because uh, you, it was not very invasive. The problem is it takes a little longer to do those or to accumulate the tests versus the nasal and oral. Um, remember to give a consistent uh, message. And this is one of the problems in the United States is we, initially the CDC said, don't use masks. And their, their, their reasoning was they wanted to save the masks for healthcare workers. But because that message went out, a lot of people just, at this point won't wear masks because they're like, well, the CDC told me not to wear them, they don't work. So it's, it's been a problem here. You need to make sure you're giving a consistent message to your team and players. Test planning. Uh, this is one area that I really got a lot into when I was planning uh, our protocols. Uh, you wanna have, think about where you're getting your tests and what the test turnaround time is. With baseball, we do the saliva test and it takes a minimum of 24 to 48 hours to get the test back. And so that means that, you know, you could have somebody who's positive and spreading it around for a couple of days before they get a, their test back. Um, now the, the advantage is in baseball is because we're being tested two to three times a week, uh, every other day is for the player and, and some of the people who have less contact with the players is twice a week. And so we, we can follow them over time and that makes it a little easier, but you have to come up with all these scenarios and what you're gonna do uh, with every result. And, and, and you, make you need to make sure you have something to deal with positive tests because you will get positive tests even if nobody's infected. Like I said, we've had uh, several, several individuals who've had positive tests uh, in both of the leagues I, I, I take care of. And, they recently had 77 tests come up negative or positive in the NFL, which they traced to a single lab, which actually had accidentally contaminated the specimens. So these are all issues that you need to have thought about when, you have, when you're planning. Um, and you have to have something ready to replace the players who have positive tests. Um, close contacts, you probably all know this, but you need to be, all three of these to be considered a close contact. You need to be within three, six feet of an injured person for over 15 minutes. And it has to be within two days of onset of their illness or a positive test. And looking back at the baseball players, I realized that 
wow, nobody really is, fits this definition with the exception of the catcher and the umpire. Even, so even though I had that picture that showed those individuals close together, really from a close contact perspective, it wasn't an issue. Um, I'm not gonna go over the restrictions for healthcare personnel, but they'll be here for you uh, if you need them. Uh, but basically, if individuals are in each situation, you look at if they're, what kind of protective equipment they're wearing to the person they're exposed to, and that allow, tells you what kind of work restrictions to place them under. It's important to, to think about contact tracing and, and pre-contact tracing. So you wanna do this in advance. And if one person comes up with a positive and you don't really have, haven't thought about this, it's gonna be really a nightmare to figure out, am I just gonna to have to test everybody who's at high risk? So if you can separate your athletes into, into smaller rotation groups and, and make sure you keep the, the paperwork, that will allow you to tell you, okay, well, they, this guy who was positive was stretching with these individuals and then did this drill with these people, and it'll allow you to kind of focal, make a more focal effort on who you need to follow. Evaluate your uh, facilities. So in baseball, we have different tiers, and you can see my badge up there. So I'm tier one, which means I have a lot of contact with players, and that means I get tested a lot more often. Uh, we wanna look and see, so again, out on the field, you can see these three people, the umpire, the catcher, and the batter are, are close together, but the batter is gonna be there only briefly. So it's really the umpire and the catcher, these two individuals who are gonna to be together most of the game. So those are the two risk people. Uh, out on the field, everybody's spread out. And then here in the dugout, you can see these little spots. These spots are marked six feet apart where people can actually sit. Social distancing. Our locker room now has, the, the, these lockers shouldn't be in the middle of the floor here. This should be actually open area with, with tables and chairs, but to spread out the lockers, uh, this is what we've done. You can see we have limitations in like even this bathroom, which uh, has room for like 12 people to be in it simultaneously. Uh, there's a limitation of four people, the showers, same thing. And oh yeah, here's opening day with me and nobody else in the stands. In the travel, we think about how you do things as far as travel. And you can see that these yellow slots are where people can actually sit in the bus. Uh, they, they skip rows and they're on, on opposite sides of the aisles. So you wanna think about all those issues. Uh, and then there's the problem of what happens when somebody breaks the quarantine. This is a guy who actually was uh, given permission by the NBA to uh, leave for a, a funeral and on the way, he well, he was out of the out of the bubble. He decided to go to a strip club because he said uh, it, it had the best wings in town. Not quite sure that was really why he was there, uh, but that was one of the problems. And and same thing with the outbreak that they had in Florida. They thought that was because of players going out on the town. So it's really important to to talk to the players about the importance of limiting their exposures. Um, we want to evaluate again what kind of uh, situations we're going to do to clean up the the uh, competitive fields. We may need to modify some of the playing rules and have on-site safety protocols all done in advance. Uh, what are, and here, uh, big problems with the fans. Uh, you know, obviously, if you're going to have fans at the seats, they're going to be next to each other. They're going to be there for a long period of time. This is our current fan base, which is a bunch of cardboard cutouts. Um, the stadium workers are going to be at risk. Uh, you know, so you need to create some kind of way to social distance these individuals. And obviously, a big part of, at least in the United States, about the uh, economic view part of sports is the eating and drinking and the stadium selling all these, uh, selling uh, food and drink. And if you're doing that, that means that people aren't wearing masks, which is another problem. Returning to play health screening. I think this is a, an important thing to think about. Uh, we need to think about where the player was, how they got there. And we've seen some problems with cardiac issues with athletes returning from uh, COVID. Um, so if a person has chest pain, uh, shortness of breath, their, their, their exercise tolerance isn't good. Uh, if they've had been hospitalized or had high level, uh, uh, more serious infection, we definitely wanna consider uh, getting an e ECG, an echocardiogram, and a high sensitivity, sensitivity cardiac tropin. There's a good 
article that was published in Sports Health recently, that's the AMSSM National High School Federation, of, uh, National Federation of High School Sports that was put out on uh, when they to expect that you should uh, consider cardiac screening. So I would recommend that if you're interested uh, in this. And then you wanna identify your high risk individuals um, and make sure that those individuals uh, have uh, more intense screening as well as uh, family risk because uh, do they have family members who have some of these risk factors as well. These are all issues that you wanna plan with uh, for your athletes. Uh, daily symptom screening. Um, we, we have a number of protocols that we do. We do take our day, temperature at least once or twice a day, depending on which organization it is. And then we have special areas uh, in this field in stadium that we, again, screen people and they have an isolation in case somebody comes up positive. When you design these screening tools, you want to you wanna think about your, your athletes. Are they people who are, take things literally or are they individuals who are going to say, oh, okay, that's normal for me. I'm not going to report that. So you can see on the, the left-hand three screens are the screens that we use for baseball. And uh, they have like cough, new onset that are worsening. Great. Uh, I like this one, rash or COVID toes. So they expect the player to know what a COVID toe is. I don't know about that. Over here is what we use at the college. And part of the problem with this screening tool is the first box you hit is no symptoms. So which is great if you have no symptoms, but basically people I think tend to ignore these things down below and just hit no symptoms and, and report. So that's something that you wanna think about when you're designing these things. Uh, this is another hospital I belong to and they just group everything in one thing and you just hit yes or no. Uh, so again, it, it's useful at times, but uh, you gotta think about how your patient population or athlete population and see how, are they, how sophisticated are they and what are they likely to do. Uh, Interesting enough, so I occasionally answer yes, because like I said, one of them I think says if I ever have a runny nose, which I do a lot because again, I have the allergies. And so it tells me not to, that I have to contact my club medical staff, which happens to be me. So I'm, I'm supposed to report to myself. Uh, on the other hand, this is the medical college where I work some of the time. And it told me I'm not cleared to report on site per this direction for different symptoms. The interesting thing is I've never been told by both by all the things to not report. So in other words, every time I'm getting flagged by one system, the other system isn't, hasn't flagged me. So that just tells you how much, how bad our screening tools are because one group considers a certain symptom like a runny nose, something that they need to know about and the other group that really could care less. So our guidelines in, in baseball, that we have received the most publicity are the no spitting, no bubble popping, chewing gum, no sunflower seeds or high five rules. Uh, again, some of them make sense, the spitting and, and, and bubble popping, yes. Sunflower seeds, the guys spit them. So again, all things that generate a lot of uh, potential droplets or aerosol particles. The, the no high five one, probably a little less so, or important since it's not as spread as much by fomite. But again, I think, Athlete and staff education are really important because we had those couple breakouts. Uh, we've had people break protocols. I think it, one of the important things that we found to be helpful with our athletes is to use the concept of protecting your teammates. I mean, guys understand that, especially in team sports that have offense and defense, they understand that concept. So that's one thing I would push that as opposed to saying you're protecting yourself because I think the level of fear that individuals have of getting this is highly variable. There's some people who are like, eh, it's just a cold or I'm young, I'm not gonna get it kind of thing. Uh, but if you say, hey, we're trying to protect the rest of your team, I think that's something that goes over better with the athletes. Uh, consistent messaging, and then always acknowledge that things may change in the future. I mean, when I went into spring training initially and we were shutting down and people were asking questions, probably half the stuff I was telling the guys was wrong because we didn't know that much about COVID at that time. Here's the NBA, you know, we're up to restart memo number 113. That, that means we're averaging like one memo a day from uh, the NBA head office. Okay, more important stuff. Return to play after a positive COVID test. What do you do? Well, the CDC says 
10 days have passed since symptom onset or positive tests, 24 hours without, with no fever, without an antipyretic, and all other symptoms have improved. Baseball and the NBA have also said that you have to have two negative PCR tests at least 24 hours apart, team physician approval, and league and players association approval. Well, as that poem to a mouse said, the best laid plans of mice and men always go wrong uh, because people don't follow the protocols. And also we had a problem where we just couldn't get the test to go negative. Uh, it, as it turns out, some individuals would just keep shedding uh, RNA, the viral RNA for days, weeks, even months and not be infectious. Well, when you have this additional criteria for two negative PCR tests, guess what? Those individuals will be kept out indefinitely. So we had one of those individuals in the league finally, and I called up the league and they, they're like, oh yeah, this has happened a couple of times. And so you can actually look at something called cycle time. And that has to do with RNA amplification. And basically after a certain point, uh, even though the test is coming back intermittently positive, when you have an RNA amplification in the high 30s, they've never seen anybody be infected by those individuals. So they've passed the other protocols. And, and you have to remember that these individuals, if they were in the general public, would actually be allowed to go back and do everything because they would have passed 10 days since their symptom problem. It's just the fact that you keep testing them that's getting them to have positive tests. Other important things to think about is the player's mental health. Uh, mental health issues are becoming a bigger problem uh, or at least a more well-known problem or publicized problem in our professional sports but there's no question that COVID-19 and the isolation that can be coming with this can can exacerb be exacerbated so it's important to acknowledge that people may be having these feelings and that they may be worse and have re online resources available for these individuals. Uh, remember to emphasize that actually this is social, uh, not social distancing, it's actually physical distancing and actually designing safe outlets for socialization uh, will help increase the, the compliance with your whatever you're, you've put together. It, make sure that you emphasize adherence to good hygiene during the social socialization though. Other important to, issues to consider include intellectual development in kids, maintaining the fitness in your athletes, maintaining the athlete skills. We certainly saw during our shutdown in the NBA that when we restarted that a lot of the guys, it took them a while to get their, get really their shooting accuracy back on. And then there's a lot of resource inequity, particularly in the, here in the United States, where certain individuals and areas and certain social economic groups are having difficulty getting the same resources that we all can get. Finally, it's important to evaluate the effectiveness of your plans. Uh, know that these things are going to be evolved, be flexible, because they will change. Longer term, we can hope that the disease burns out. We could hope for herd immunity, which the current estimates are we need 60 to 70 percent of the population to be the, the immune, which hasn't, hasn't come anywhere close in any of these scenarios or countries. Uh, we can have better disease treatments, or, or we could learn to live with this. Vaccination, I'm running out of time, so I'm not really going to go over that, other than to say that certainly is uh, something that we're, that hopefully will come up and that maybe this will change a lot of what we're saying. Um, as, as, as our coordinator for the Brewers says, use an abundance of caution. It's better to be safe than sorries. Uh, we postponed our home opener because uh, the team that we were coming in to play all of a sudden had uh, two people uh, with positive tests, we, so we tested them, the team, and the next day it was four, and it ultimately, I think, went up to uh, uh, 17 individuals as they kept postponing more and more player, uh, finding more and more positive. So uh, it, it's, you gotta be taking a lot of things into account, but I would say when we were thinking about returning people to play, it's better to be safe than sorry. So what have I learned so far? Bubbles have the least risk, no question about it. Baseball players do not seem to be spreading COVID-19 while in competition. It's when they're traveling and doing things which uh, are off, off out of their hotels. Uh, social distancing is important. 
be very cautious with traveling and the time away from the teens is highest risk, especially bars and nightclubs. Have a plan for positive tests and think, know that things will change. This is the new slide. Yesterday's headline, uh, at least yesterday here, 82420, uh, was the report of the first uh, person who was, supposed, was, was well documented as getting corona again. Uh, so his, he first got uh, coronavirus uh, in March. Uh, he had mild symptoms, it, he re which resolved by early April. He was antibody negative after his bout. Uh, th and this is why this is thought to be the first document case because they actually genotyped the virus that he was infected with. And it was the genotype that is found most commonly in the United States and England. And then he flew back to Hong Kong after having recovered. He flew back uh, from a trip to Spain on, in, on August 15th. Uh, the airport in Hong Kong was doing routine screening of everybody returning. And he was found to be positive. They genotyped it and he had a different genotype. This was a genotype that was typically found in England and Switzerland. And he, this time he turned antibody positive. So in four and a half months, he apparently has been reinfected. Now, this has not been published in the peer-reviewed journal yet, uh, but it's uh, apparently going to be. So to summarize, analyze the specific needs of your athletes, analyze the risk and risk tolerance you have, acknowledge to your athletes it's impossible to have zero risk, make sure you make your plans in conjunction with the public health officials. You have to remember to evaluate how your plans are going to affect your community's health. It's kind of like covering a marathon or a race or an event. If heat or becomes a problem and you, you realize that you're sending so many people to the hospital that you're gonna overround the emergency room and that if your grandmother has a heart attack, there's gonna be all the people from your race with heat illness crowding up that emergency room. That means if you're affecting public health, you should probably shut down your event. So I think that's an important thing we need to think about uh, with athletes and sports events is when is it good for the public overall as far as morale, but also how it affects the general uh, medical resources. Uh, keep up with current knowledge. It's going to be changing a lot. Acknowledge that things are going to change and that some of the stuff that you will give in your players will be out of date. So, so finally, just be flexible. Our knowledge about COVID-19 keeps evolving and so must our plans and responses. So these are today's headlines. I don't know what tomorrow's will say. Um, thank you for your attention. Uh, this was uh, me after the international team physician meeting in Cape Town, and hopefully I'll be able to travel because this is me now stuck in Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Craig. What an absolutely outstanding synopsis of a, a massive, massive subject that, as you alluded to, is expanding daily. So very difficult to put it all together. And you did that superbly and went into a lot of detail, which I think we, we greatly appreciate. I mean, certainly there are a few, few differences we've picked up between what's happening in America and what's happening in South Africa. I mean, the major difference here, thank goodness, we have a couple of good um, uh, chicken takeout facilities, so we don't have to go to strip clubs to get chicken wings, which is, which is useful. But in the audience tonight, we've got a number of our, our uh, leading sports medicine doctors, unsurprisingly, and a lot of them are involved with football, soccer. So there's a number of questions that are related to what's happening in our bubbles at the moment. So if I can go through some of those, if you could just give us some answers or your sure. opinions, we'd appreciate that. So in your bubbles, are you strictly isolating players or are you letting them socialize uh, within the bubbles? The bubbles, are, they're allowing the players to socialize within the bubbles among the people who are tested regularly. Although they're also discouraging close socialization um, in that they still advise you to main six feet, et cetera. Um, but that's with the NBA bubble. In baseball, they actually just came out with a, with a new recommendation that when you're eating, that you not only do the 
the six feet apart, but you also face away from each other and don't talk. So uh, I don't know if people are really following that, but remember baseball is not a strict bubble. Baseball is kind of a, this little movable bubble, which has a lot of holes in it. But the NBA, which is, which actually to date has not had any true positives. They've had some false positives, but they have not had any uh, individual get infected so far who's stayed in that boundary. But that's why they're very strict on individuals who break the boundaries. Uh, those individuals who have broken the boundaries basically have to quarantine um, for 10 days. Okay. What about the use of swimming pool facilities uh, in the bubbles? I mean, uh, chlorinated swimming pools should be reasonably well disinfected. Is that correct? That is correct. It's not been shown to transmit via uh, swimming, at least the water. Now, that doesn't mean you can't aerosolize it when you're breathing in and out. So again, they still recommend that you take precautions like theoretically not sharing lanes. Although again, you, you look at the close contact definitions and say, are you really gonna be next to somebody for 15 minutes? Uh, probably not. So I, I would agree with you. I don't think uh, swimming pools are a major concern. Okay. You we spoke a lot about masks and I think you certainly cleared up a lot of the issues around the science uh, behind wearing masks. And it's amazing with that, that there's still debate, you know, in some societies about wearing masks. But I think there's still some contention about masks while exercising and you know whether there's some restriction on breathing what is the practical advice that you're giving to athletes uh, the practical advice is, so far the studies i have seen is that from a physiologic physiologically there should be no real reason to avoid a mask it's not like you develop a lot of co2 to with with the with the general mask now an n95 mask without an xl valve that may be a different situation but with the general cloth mask that most people are wearing, um, it shouldn't be an issue as far as athletic performance, unless the thing is interfering with vision, comfort, and those issues. So I think that's the real thing is to work with the athletes and get a mask that is comfortable and that they'll wear. And again, emphasize the fact that they're protecting their teammates. And again, you have to look at your sport and say, are you at close contact during the sporting event itself? If the answer is no, in theory, you don't have to, you, you really don't need to be wearing the mask. It's more the travel with sitting on the bench, sitting in the locker rooms, that's where you need to be wearing your mask because that's when you're next to somebody for a long period of time. Okay. You alluded to saliva tests and I think you said that you, you, your league is doing saliva tests. Now, what's the sensitivity of those oropharyngeal tests compared to nasopharyngeal swabs, uh, which seem to be the gold standard. Yeah, it depends on which test you do. The saliva tests are not quite, don't have quite this uh, sensitivity, but they're pretty close depending on which, which test, the, test you're using. Um, actually, it's funny because, I, so for the NBA, I was being uh, nares tested, not nasopharyngeal, but nares every other day. And doing the saliva test. And initially I was pretty excited that we were gonna do the saliva test in the baseball. But the problem with the saliva test is, let me see, I got one of these kits here. All right, here's the kit, here's the kit. I'll... So I have to fill this thing, can you see that? So yeah. I have to fill this thing up with saliva. You know how long that takes to get that much saliva? It, it's, kind of, it's kind of a pain to fill that sucker up. Um, Although, of course, the athletes being athletes make a competition of this, and they have, they, initially their idea was see if they can fill this tube in one, one shot. And so <laughs> no, you'd go to the parking lot, and nobody would be talking because they'd all be mumbling because they're all not swallowing. Uh, but that got to be too easy because they can do that. They've all figured out how to do that. Now, so now their latest goal is to see if they can spit right on the line without having to pour anything out. Because if you put too much in these tubes, it's a problem as well. Uh, yeah, so the, if you're testing repeatedly, like on a regular basis, your team, I think it, it doesn't matter as long as you have a reasonably sensitive and specific test. The saliva or the nasal pharyngeal are both okay because you're going to be doing it so often that, you, that the slight difference in sensitivity doesn't matter. Um, so it's probably more which one's more convenient and which one you can get faster, I would say, on a turnaround time.
Okay, let's just clarify those return to play criteria. As I saw in your slides, you're advocating or CDC is advocating 10 days from the onset of symptoms as long as you're symptom free and fever free for 24 hours. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, that's it. So you have to be, you ha your symptoms have to be significantly improved. Your respiratory symptoms have to be gone and you want to be off feet, off any antipyretics with no fever for at least uh, 24 hours. Now that seems fairly aggressive in terms of, you know, pushing return to play. I think most of our criteria are looking at 10 to 14 days after being symptom free, you know, of having a, a window period. Um, yeah, you know, that, that, that's symptomatic for eight or nine days and then asymptomatic for 24 hours to send them back seems reasonably quick. I would agree with you. And as, as I said, that is their guidelines for the average person. And I think to, you know, I think this is where you use the abundance of caution. And I tend to be a little bit more conservative than the CDC guidelines, but those are the guidelines that they say you can go back on because in theory, you're not, you're not infectious during that time period. However, having said that, I will say that you, you have to look at the person as an individual because part of it has to do with the viral load the individual has and how their immune system is reacting to it. So certainly if a person has symptoms 14 days out, you're, you're not going to want to send them back just because, well, in theory, they can go back or, the other thing is if the person's got a more serious infection, they probably have a higher, higher viral load. So again, I think, you, you, yeah, that may be the minimum, but when you're in a situation where you want to prevent it from spreading them out among team members I, I, and you're in close contact, I, I would agree with you. I think I personally prefer a longer period of time. Let's talk about that persistent positive test because that is a real problem that, that people are experiencing. The players set out the 10 or 14 days, some of them haven't had symptoms at all, and yet that second test is positive. Are you yeah. discarding that now and not actually uh, using that as one of the criteria? Are you doing cycle threshold testing on those players? What is your, your philosophy? Yeah, um, so what we are now doing is doing cycle thresholds. Um, now, cycle thresholds, basically, the more time, the more RNA you have, the less cycle thresholds it takes, so they're inversely proportional. Most systems, I believe, will say if you reach a, a cycle threshold, well, basically, they're, they'll have a setting, and most of them are probably around 40, that if they haven't detected RNA by the time they've gone through 40 cycles, they will declare it a negative test. But in theory, if you keep retesting and retesting, I don't know, get a cycle, cycle threshold of 100 or whatever, you know, you, you might pick up a little small amount. And so what we've come to the conclusion of at, from the in, uh, Major League Baseball is that there's been a bunch of individuals who are in the high 30s, and they seem to be, and so they've, the, so far the research has shown that those people are not infectious anymore. Now, here's the caution thing that I, I would say, if you're looking at planning uh, a COVID protocol, is you need to make sure your lab can do those cycle thresholds, because we found out that our lab has two main machines and one counts cycle thresholds and the other doesn't. The other one just spits out a positive or a negative. So you need to make sure you have access to a machine that has, can do the cycle thresholds if you're gonna use that criteria. The other thing we've done in baseball is now once a person's cleared, they don't test them for at least seven, they'll skip seven testing cycles on that person because so many of them are coming back positive. So if you've had, if you managed to, you, you've had a COVID positive test, you managed to clear, at that point, you, you quit testing them for at least seven to, four, to 14 days, depending on how long you want to put it out. Because we know that people are now intermittently shedding RNA uh, from the nares, and that they don't seem to be infectious once they've had those couple negative tests. Surely there's an argument for differentiating between players who've tested positive and are totally asymptomatic, and we've had lots of those, and others who have been symptomatic. In your return to play criteria, would you investigate the symptomatic player differently, in particular from a cardiac risk perspective, ECGs, blood tests, etc.? Yeah, the, the, the more symptomatic 
So there's two approaches. Is one has to do with just general symptoms and how uh, serious the infection is. If, if the person's serious enough to be in a hospital, I would clearly do a cardiac workup because that person probably had a more systemic uh, infection. Uh, so that's one group it is looking at severity. The second is looking at specific symptoms. Um, I think when you start thinking about individuals who are more likely to have some kind of myocarditis, which tends to be the one that I think that's the one thing that we worry about since that can give more long-term effects. Uh, so you definitely want to <clears throat> look at symptoms of chest pain, um, shortness of breath, uh, palpitations, and this is probably the, the key one to, to think about is general exercise intolerance, the inability to get back to their normal exercise level easily. I mean, everybody's going to have some fatigue, so it's going to be a little fuzzy, but if they are just really dragging compared to the average person, I, I definitely think it's worth uh, at minimum getting an ECG, but probably considering uh, an echo. And, and the high sensitivity cardiac tropins are pretty easy to get too. So I, I think that would be another thing I would recommend. And you also seem to be alluding to some sort of exercise stress test before they go back. So they don't just go back and join the training squad. You wean them back in and, and you give them a functional test of their exercise tolerance. Is that correct? Uh, well, we don't do a formal exercise stress test. Uh, it's more of a just gradually weaning them back. And field if they test, but it could be done yes, on the field. Yeah. Correct, a field test. If 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 they are feeling what we see as an average return, then we need to definitely get, get further work up. In your literature review, did you come across any sort of evidence now of potential long-term effects of COVID-19 for athletes, particularly obviously cardiac we've alluded to, but respiratory as well. And there seems to be evidence now of it, of it as a more of a multiple, multi-organ disease. Any evidence of long-term sequelae? Well, I mean, there's definitely individuals who seem to have symptoms that are prolonged. I don't know if we could consider them long-term sequelae at this point, because I don't think the disease has been around long enough to really know what the uh, long-term effects are or not. I, I, I definitely think there are individuals out there, particularly who had the more severe cases, uh, that are that are certainly probably going to have long-term effects. I think probably from our point of view as physicians caring for relatively healthy athletes is what are the effects of the mild, I'm, you know, if you have a mild case of it, what are going to be the long-term effects on that person's performance levels? That's, I think, a big unknown that we don't know at this point. You know, because I think that's one of our problems here is our young athletes, our college athletes, who are, some of them are wanting to play these sports. And they're also the ones who are most likely to be at, at bars and nightclubs right now, and most likely to get the infection and have a mild case or even maybe totally asymptomatic. So the question is, what are those asymptomatic individuals? Are they having some low level effect on lungs, heart, or muscles or other, you know, tissues that we just don't know at this point? Yeah. Going back to your testing, uh, after, after a positive test, you have a player who has a persistent positive result, but is asymptomatic as it cleared all the other clinical criteria. Do you allow him or her back into the bubble? Um, again, that's where we usually hit. We, we try and get the PCR cycle times, uh, our cycle thresholds, is because those are the individuals who we found like in the high 30s usually is where, our, where they will allow them back in. And we haven't had a problem with those individuals. We have had those individuals. So we've had a couple guys who, I, who have had publicly positive tests. And we did struggle with a couple of them because what would happen is before we came up with this criteria is we'd have a, they'd go negative and then their next test would be positive. And then they'd have a negative, negative, positive. And, and they just kept going back and forth. And so they weren't being cleared. And, we've, and after both the NBA and the MLB came up with a bunch of these players, they started doing more investigation and came up with these criteria. So, I mean, the take home message from what I think you're saying is firstly, treat each individual case uh, on its own merits from a clinical and uh, result point of view. And secondly, know what you're going to do in the case of a positive test. You've emphasized that time and again. 
have those protocols well laid out and well thought out beforehand. Would that be correct? Yeah, absolutely. Having, having your protocols uh, well thought up in advance is, a, is, is really important. But having said that, you also have to have some flexibility because like this persistent positive thing was not something I had come up with as, as a possibility. Oh, here's another one that we had. It was, let's see, a uh, bunch of positive tests, negative, negative, then negative, a bunch of negative tests, but no antibodies. Because that was part of the original protocol is you had that positive antibodies. So are you, are you it, doing antibody testing regularly, routinely? Uh, not routinely, but irregularly. We all had to get uh, antibody tested before the season. And then supposedly we're getting tested at intervals on antibodies, but I have yet to be personally tested again for antibodies. So I'm not sure what this interval that they talk about is since I haven't seen it come up again. Um, the problem with the antibodies is they're not tremendously helpful as far as return to play, I, I think, other than if you're, one of, if you're one of these, so if you're one of these people who's got, kind of going positive, negative, positive, negative, uh, then if you have positive antibodies, it's useful because th then it's pretty clear that you've mounted an immune response and you're probably not infectious. The problem is that person who goes up and down from positive to negative tests who has no antibodies, that's where the, the cycle thresholds really, or cycle times really come into use. So you might actually have three investigations you have to interpret in sync, the actual uh, PCR test, the antibody tests, and the cycle threshold tests. You might have to make use of all three and, and interpret uh, it in its own clinical context and, and on its own merits. Correct, correct. Yeah. And, and again, that's where I, like I said, that cycle threshold is really important to have a machine that can actually come yeah. up with those numbers for you. Last question, because we've overstayed our welcome, and that's only because of the uh, interest people have shown. And I can tell you, for a long session, not many people have dropped off, so it says a lot about the presentation. But I'm going to ask you one last question, and that's about musculoskeletal effects that you've noticed. And I'm going to ask it from two points of view. One is having had a layoff and then coming back into competition, have you noticed an increase in incidence uh, of injuries? And secondly, uh, do you think there may be an effect of the virus itself on uh, soft tissues that might exacerbate the risk for injury? Okay, I'll answer the second one first because the answer is I don't know. Um, I don't think it's been shown one way or the other. If it has, I certainly don't know it or I'm not aware of it. So uh, this, the, the first question is, yeah, I do think there has been a increase in some of the soft tissue injuries because it depended on what athletic facilities the, people, the athletes had um, available to them in the layoff and how they were conditioning themselves, uh, whether or not they were exposed to the disease. Because even individuals who had good access to athletic facilities, uh, there were some who you know, had an individual who, who were exposed and so they had to go into isolation. So those individuals, um, fitness levels drop tremendously. And so I think we have seen a little bit more in soft tissue injuries from, you know, guys basically getting started pretty quickly. So I think it's really important that you do a good preseason training period with these individuals, because I think a lot of them may not be in their typical return to season shape. Great. Craig, I'm going to wrap it up there and thank you very, very much. Uh, you've come with inherent knowledge, you've researched the topic very well, and you've given us great uh, experience from what's happening in the field. And we couldn't have asked for better. So we really appreciate it. We have to get you back to South Africa again and into one of those game vehicles. So uh, we look forward to trying to do that. But uh, thank you very much. Keep up the good work. And from Vit Sport and Health to you've set up a great rapport with we're going to keep in touch with you and, and hope we can reciprocate from the side one day so thank you very much for the time and effort you put into this talk thanks john and good luck to everybody on this call i hope uh, everybody stays safe and their athletes uh, stay healthy brilliant thank you very much i'll wrap it up from a wish point of view as well thank you to asina lita our sponsors Thank you to Dr. Robin Saggers, who's in the background managing all the technical aspects and has done a great job in communicating and promoting this. Thank you to our social media team. Thank you to all of you for tuning in. 
wait for the next slide, which will show you the next talk coming up, which is going to be talking about running shoes, how to choose them and prescribe them, which I think is going to be very relevant as the weather improves and we all get out onto the road. Uh, and then also, if you want to have your CPD points, go onto that link. Please, we must ask that you put very accurate details in there. Otherwise, your CPD certificate will reflect the wrong details. So full names, correct registration numbers, and, and, and everything absolutely correct, if you don't mind. And then join us next week for the discussion on running shoes. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great evening.